This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, thank you very much, um, Peter, and welcome back. And for those of you who weren't here last week, welcome. Uh, big complicated subject this week. Uh, I've got quite a lot to get through. It's get, so it is going to be very much a kind of a sketch, an outline of something that in what will eventually be the book of the lectures will be worked out in more detail. Uh, Shakespeare and classical psychology, well, that's a, that's a big subject. And um, my, my aim is to focus it through the figure of Hercules, and I, I, I hope that that will work for you. But I actually want to begin um, with two modern writers, two late 20th century writers, thinking about the psychology of Shakespeare's characters. This is Ted Hughes uh, from his book Shakespeare and the Goddess of Complete Being. Hamlet looking at Ophelia, sees his mother in bed with his uncle and goes mad. Othello, looking at his pure wife, sees Cassio's whore and goes mad. Macbeth, looking at the throne of Scotland and listening to his wife, hears the witches, the three faces of Hecate and the invitation to hell and goes mad. Lear, looking at Cordelia, sees Goneril and Regan and goes mad. Antony, looking at his precious queen, sees the rebordered nag of Egypt betraying him to the very heart of loss and goes, in a sense, mad. Timon, looking at his loving friends, sees the wolf pack of Athenian creditors and greedy whores and goes mad. Coriolanus, looking at his wife and mother, sees the Roman mob who want to tear him to pieces and begins to act like a madman. Leontes, looking at his wife, sees Polixenes' whore and begins to act like a madman. Posthumus, looking at his bride, who of his lawful pleasure oft restrained him, sees the one Yakimo mounted like a full acorned boar and begins to act like a madman characteristically Hughesian sentence, uh, full of deep insight as well as uh, a little bit of distortion and perhaps in some ways uh, as full of Ted Hughes as it is of Shakespeare. Um, but what he's grasped there is the sense that at the heart of so many of Shakespeare's tragedies is some kind of explosion of passion bound to questions to do with woman and sex, which leads to a, a destabilization, a kind of madness in the hero. This from Ted Hughes, one of whose crucial works was a, uh, a, uh, a translation for Peter Brook um, of Seneca's Oedipus, uh, performed um, at the Old Vic in the late 1960s. By comparison or contrast to Ted Hughes, Marilyn French, a major feminist writer um, of the late 20th century. Her book, Shakespeare's Division of Experience, one of the very first examples of feminist literary criticism of Shakespeare. This from the publisher's blurb, just to sort of uh, summarize the argument. William Shakespeare regarded men and women quite differently. In his early plays, the so-called masculine qualities of prowess, bravery, and individualism were accorded more respect than feminine attributes of mercy, compassion, and intuitiveness. Yet in his later plays, there is evidence of a reversal in Shakespeare's attitudes, a new fear of the power of the masculine principle, a new admiration for the feminine. Marilyn French, author of the acclaimed novels, The Women's Room and the Bleeding Heart, offers a feminist perspective on each of Shakespeare's plays. More than a brilliantly original literary interpretation, this fascinating volume provides penetrating insight into attitudes towards men, women, love, and power in Western culture. And indeed, French's book, which I, I think is, is, is now rather underrated and neglected in the history of feminist Shakespearean criticism, although having exactly the kind of problems of over that Hughes's Shakespeare and the Goddess of Complete Being has, the attempt to, to ram the whole of Shakespeare's diversity into a single thesis, nevertheless has grasped something important. We wouldn't go so far as to say men bad, women good in Shakespeare, but there are an awful lot of bad and troubling men and uh, equally um, an awful lot of redemptive and wonderful women in Shakespeare. Certainly Shakespeare seems to have had a capacity to write sympathetic female roles beyond that of most of his contemporaries. I mentioned briefly last week um, that next week it sees the publication of my edition of the, what used to be called the Shakespeare Apocrypha, uh, which we are calling collaborative plays by Shakespeare and others. And in that uh, volume, we argue that characters of the Countess of Salisbury in the co collaborative play of Edward III, and a key element of the character of Alice Arden in the anonymous play of Arden of Faversham, were roles written by Shakespeare. And it accords with the, 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 the sense of Shakespeare as the, the 
greatest writer for women in the 1590s. And of course, there is no doubt that those, those moments where traditional gender roles are reversed are key pressure points in Shakespeare. If, if you, uh, I'm not going to say as much as I would like to, given time, about Shakespeare's powerful women today. That'll have to wait for the book. But it is very striking, isn't it, that when Lady Macbeth, Macbeth wishes to turn herself into a kind of demonic, ambitious figure, the way she does so is by asking to be unsexed. Um, and there's that whole strain of language of her accusing Macbeth of not being masculine enough and of her, as it were, defeminizing herself, you know, ripping the baby from her breast and so on. Um, Marilyn French, famously in the women's room, said whatever they may be in public life, whatever their relationships with men, in their relations with women, all men are rapists and that's all they are. They rape us with their eyes, their laws and their codes, a kind of iconic statement of uh, the feminist movement. And certainly when we think about male gods in classical times, uh, there is a pretty strong repertoire of rapists. Jove, Jupiter, Zeus, whatever you wish to call him, uh, has quite a criminal record on that respect. Uh, I'm just reminding you of that in the figure of um, leader, um, leader in the Swan. Um, that's Rubens. Um, and of course, Hercules. Um, Hercules allegedly on, on one, one night slept with 50 different women. Um, uh, Hercules perhaps more often seduces than rapes, uh, but of course that borderline between seduction and rape is always a complicated one. And certainly if disguise is involved, it has to be rape. Uh, the image on the right um, shows uh, the, uh, the, the, the birth um, of Hercules. Uh, Hercules, remember, was born of Alcmena, um, and there we have, yet once again, Jove. Jo but Jove has managed to disguise himself as Alcmena's husband. So she's looking rather willing here because she thinks it's her husband, but really it's Jove in disguise. Um, so, yes, bad men. Uh, 95% of the prison population in this country uh, is male. Um, most of the guns uh, are handled by men. The wars are started by men. Most of the dictators are men, as are most of the wife beaters and rapists. Uh, the most criminals in prison um, are prostitutes, and their, their, their very raison d'etre is male desire. Um, so there, there are some live arguments to be had about the psychology of male sexual power. The notion of a, a great heroic figure who in an explosion of anger commits a sexual crime uh, in a way that, that, you know, there are many precedents for that in classical mythology. Hercules would be one of them. One would only have to name, for example, O.J. Simpson or Oscar Pistorius to see that these are eternal stories, modern stories, as well as ancient ones. That idea of a kind of eruption, a kind of blind moment of passion, is one of the absolute keys to tragedy. And I think it's also a key to Shakespearean psychology. Uh, one of the things I want to suggest today is that um, the aspect of classical psychology that is less important to Shakespeare is the traditional idea of the four humours that was so important to Ben Jonson. Ben Jonson, Shakespeare's friend, rival, essentially invented the drama of humours where you take characters who have an excess of one of the particular humours, be it melancholy, choler, um, and in a way Johnson's uh, dramas play out a kind of schematic in set of images of humoral psychology. But the point about humoral psychology is that um, there is a certain kind of flatness or stability to it. It's predetermined. A character is melancholy, is choleric. And you can see that in the way that Johnson names his characters. He, as it were, names them by their psychology. Shakespeare doesn't write like that. He doesn't write a kind of steady state psychology. Shakespeare is continuously interested in character in process, in character being formed and changing as the action unfolds. And that moment of movement from sanity to madness, the eruption of emotion, is one of the keys to that. It's striking in this regard when you look at Shakespeare's handling of his literary sources, but very often he will 
remove the prior motivation of a character. So, for example, in the source for King Lear, Lear wants to resign the throne because, because he wants to grieve because Mrs. Lear has died. Or in the source for Othello, Iago wants to bring down Othello because he's in love with Desdemona himself. Shakespeare likes to remove that prior motivation and instead the psychology emerges through the process of the drama. So I'm going to look at four themes um, today, uh, if, if I've got time. I want to look at the que questions of choice, uh, focusing on the choice of Hercules, to think a bit about masculinity in the context of the labour of Hercules and its opposite, I the effeminization in the context of the Hercules and Omphali story. There'll then be a little slightly theoretical digression regarding key aspect of psychology, the will, um, and that will be approached um, via the figure of Seneca. And then I want to end with anger, the Senecan furor, and the madness of Hercules. So first, the choice of Hercules. And this, of course, is a very um, traditional uh, idea, the sense of the choice between duty and pleasure. This is um, Annibale Caracci's um, famous uh, painting of the choice of Hercules. As those great... Warburgians, Vint and Panofsky have reminded us the figure, the, the, the image, the iconology of the choice of Hercules, between Hercules as a young man confronted by two women, one representing duty, duty, one representing pleasure, was enormously influential in Renaissance iconology. Um, I'm, I, this is one of those influences that is, uh, it's, it, it's kind of in the air of the age. It's, uh, Shakespeare, I, Shakespeare had not read the, the original story in Xenophon where this is, uh, uh, the, 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 where the story is told, but it's the notion of this, this choice um, has, has, has it's, it's everywhere, and in that sense, you don't need a direct source for it. It is actually the case that Ben Jonson, shortly after Shakespeare's death, uh, dramatised the story of the choice of Hercules in a mask called Pleasure Reconciled to Virtue. Um, but for Shakespeare, I think we, we see this aspect of it most obviously in Antony and Cleopatra, his great drama of the choice between pleasure and duty. The second soldier, on hearing the music of Oboys, mysterious music under the stage, says, "'Tis the god Hercules, whom Antony loved, now leaves him." Obviously, in one sense, Antony is a Herculean figure because of his great military strength. Um, he's described as a demi atlas which is, of course, an allusion to the moment in one of the labours where Hercules is given the job of uh, holding up the earth uh, on behalf of Atlas. But I, I think it, it, Antony is also Hercules because of this choice. I will to Egypt, he says, and though I make this marriage, the political marriage to um, Octavius's sister, Octavia, I make this marriage for my peace, in the East my pleasure lies. Pleasure is an absolutely crucial word in Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, here's Antony himself. The present pleasure by revolution lowering does become the opposite of itself. She's good, being gone. The hand could pluck her back that shoved her on. I must from this enchanting queen break off. Ten thousand harms more than the ills I know. My idleness doth hatch. That's Antony uh, when everything's gone wrong in the battle, trying to get himself back into a Roman way of thinking where pleasure, Cleopatra and Egypt are associated with idleness. But here's Octavius himself, the quintessential Roman, the future Augustus, talking of Antony. If he filled his vacancy with his voluptuousness, full surfeits and the dryness of his bones call on him for it. But to confound such time that drums him from his sport, a word closely linked to pleasure, and speaks as loud as his own state and ours, tis to be chid as we rate boys who, being mature in knowledge, pawn their experience to their present pleasure and so rebel to judgment whole series of, uh, sort of Roman neo-Roman ideas about experience and judgment played off against the pleasure and idleness of Egypt. And I'm not going to read the whole of this exchange, but uh, it's a wonderful example early in the play of an acting out of the choice of Hercules. A messenger comes with news from Rome, so associated with uh, Antony's, Antony's public duties, 
what are regarded as Roman virtues of service, public duty. Um, Antony wants to send the messengers away, let Rome in Tiber melt and the wide arch of the ranged empire fall. Here is my space. And then he kisses Cleopatra, the nobleness of life is to do thus. A little later he says, but stirred by Cleopatra, now for the love of love and her soft hours, let's not confound the time with conference harsh. There's not a minute of our lives should stretch without some pleasure now. What sport tonight? Cleopatra suggesting he should hear the ambassador's fie wrangling queen. No, he says, we will not. Turning from the choice of Hercules to the labour of Hercules, um, in the props cupboard of Philip Henslow, uh, the proprietor of the rival acting company um, to Shakespeare's, we find Cerberus's head, a lion skin, a club, the apples are from the gardens of the Hesperides. There is a lost two-part Henslow play on the subject of the labours of Hercules. Um, sometime in the mid-1590s it belongs. The labours of Hercules, a very um, well-known uh, set of stories. Um, Hercules associated above all with his strength. Uh, that club and the skin of the lion, uh, which having killed the lion he wears, appear everywhere, whether it's a stage Hercules or um, a, 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 an image in painting. Uh, I've just put up here as background to this a detail from a, a, a Roman mosaic from, from Spain in the third century um, of Hercules and his club, and you can see the lion's tail hanging down at the back. Um, Shakespeare on a number of occasions refers to these labours of Hercules um, for some reason I don't quite know why the, the, the story of the rescue um, of Hesione from the sea monster is one that Shakespeare refers to uh, se several times um, go Hercules they, uh, as someone says in Merch Merchant of Venice um, in as early as the taming of the shrew, wooing is regarded as a Herculean task. Um, leave that labour to great Hercules and let it be more than Alcides twelve, says Gremio. Late in his career in Coriolanus, Coriolanus speaking in admiration of his mother uh, and, and of her, her, her kind of masculinity and, and, and uh, her strength, Nay, mother, resume that spirit when you were wont to say, if you had been the wife of Hercules, six of his labours you would have done and saved your husband so much sweat. In gentle mode, Hippolyta in Midsummer Night's Dream remembers being with Hercules and Cadmus once when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. Where did Shakespeare find out about the labours of Hercules? Well, the answer is, as he found out about so many things about the classics in Ovid, um, in Metamorphoses, Book 9, there is a fairly attenuated version of the story of the labours, um, chopping off the heads of the Hydra of Lerna um, and a number of the other labours. Uh, but actually, the, I think the fuller source for the labours is actually the ninth of Ovid's Heroides. So remember those letters written in the voice of deserted women, um, which are a very significant uh, text for Shakespeare. Ovid, Shakespeare's, I think, great precursor in the animation of female voices. And Deonara, who we'll come to at the end of the lecture, uh, voices or writes the ninth of the Heroides and in a kind of retrospective narrative goes through the labours there. Um, in Metamorphoses 9, it is the story of the madness of Hercules, Deonara and the shirt of Nessus, which we'll come to, uh, that is the main emphasis. 
Still, there's no doubt that Shakespeare knew well the story of that key task of Hercules um, to get the golden apples from the gardens of the Hesperides. This is not actually Shakespeare, it's his collaborator, uh, Wilkins, who wrote the first half of Pericles, but uh, clearly Shakespeare knew the first half, because otherwise he couldn't have written the second half of the play. Before these stands this fair Hesperides with golden fruit, but dangerous to be touched. For death like dragons here affright thee hard. Her face like heaven enticeth thee to view her countless glory which desert must gain, and which without desert, because thine eye presumes to reach, all thy whole heap must die. The particularly interesting thing about the labour involving the apples of the Hesperides is its association with desire and with the female. Um, I sort of want to just suggest that this, this is a granted uh, a rather later image. It's from uh, Lafito in 1724, Meurs des sauvages américains comparé au meurs des premiers temps, the manners of the savages of America compared with the manners of early times. Um, but what, what interests me is uh, the, the way you've, you, you've actually got a, a, a temptress figure of Circe on one side. You've got Hercules uh, you can, you, with the... Uh, the lion wrapped around him, lion's paw there and the tail behind him, and he's, he's brought three-headed Cerberus back. But his next task is to get the apples of the Hesperides. But the way that uh, the snake is wrapped around the tree of the Hesperides is, a clear, is clearly a piece of synthesis bringing together a sort of temptation Garden of Eden fruit story with the apples of the Hes Hesperides. So the, um, it, it seems to me of all the labours, the one that Shakespeare is most interested in is the, the Garden of the Hesperides, and that's because it sets up an opposition between the notion of Hercules being associated with masculine strength, military strength, Hercules with his club, and notions of uh, the temptations of the erotic, the temptations of desire. I've got a hunch, although I can't prove it, that Shakespeare's Love's Labours Lost was some kind of a response to these now lost Labours of Hercules plays in Henslow's repertoire. There is a very interesting dialogue always going on between what Shakespeare's acting company are putting on and what the other companies are putting on. Because, of course, Hercules is a significant figure within Love's Labours Lost, the page, Little Moat, plays the part um, of Hercules in the pageant of the Nine Worthies that the subplot comic characters put on. Um, he sh I mean, what, you know, that's kind of a, a whole kind of uh, set of rather lovely jokes. You know, Amado saying he is not so big as the end of his club. Um, there's a there's a certain amount of rather rude punning involved in the club. We'll see another example of that in a bit. Shall I have audience, says Holofernes, he shall present Hercules in minority. His enter and exit shall be strangling a snake. And I will have an apology for that purpose. You remember one of the stories of Hercules is that even while he was an infant, he could sort of strangle a snake in his grave. An excellent device, says Moat. So if any of the audience hiss, you may cry, well done, Hercules, now thou crushes the snake. It's a fantastic idea. What do you what do, you do when the audience hiss because your play is no good? You turn it round and make it part of your story. Great Hercules, presented by this imp, this is the beginning of the pageant of the Worthies, whose club killed Cerberus, that three-headed canus. Um, Shakespeare is, is actually not alone among his contemporaries in getting uh, the, the, the 11th label wrong, of course. The job was actually to, as in we saw in that engraving, to capture Cerberus and bring him up from the under Wonderworld, not to kill him, but uh, there, there are a number of references in the drama and poetry at the time to killing Cerberus. And when he was a babe, a child, a shrimp, thus did he strangle serpents in his manus. Um, but, of course, Hercules also falls in love. Amado asks Moat, comfort me, boy, what great men have been in love? Hercules, master, says Moat. Amado, most sweet Hercules. Then he asks for more authorities, more examples of great figures, uh, as it were, great figures representative of masculinity and strength falling in love. Um, and this subsequently leads Armado to say, love is a familiar, love is a devil. Because, of course, Armado's problem is that he's fallen in love with, 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 with Jaconetta. So uh, he's in danger of uh, breaking the prescription on desire that is the guiding rule of the academe in the play. 
There is no evil angel but love, yet Samson was so tempted and he had an excellent strength. Yet was Solomon so seduced and he had a very good wit. Cupid's butt shaft is too hard for Hercules' club. We'll pass over that one, I think. Um, and therefore too much odds for a Spaniard's rapier. Most significantly, however, and once again, I'm not going to read the whole quote for you, but this is one of the greatest speeches in all of Shakespeare, the moment when Barone acknowledges that the choice of a chaste and virtuous life of study, the project of the academe, um, has fallen. It was the wrong choice because of its renunciation of love. So it's taking us to, um, in a way, a development from the choice of Hercules, uh, the, the, the old sort of you know, pleasure versus virtue idea, um, to the way that, I'm going to come on to this in, in, in a moment, the way that in Stoic philosophy um, there are three choices. There's the choice of public service, the, the choice of, as it were, public duty. There's the choice of contemplation of academic study. This is the vita activa, vita contemplativa. And then there is also the choice of idleness or pleasure or voluptuousness. Um, what Barone uh, speaks for here uh, is the, the choice of love. And in this great speech, he argues that love needs to be chosen, not least because love is associated with charity. Uh, who can sever love from charity. There isn't a fascinating kind of elision of a notion of erotic love with a Christian idea of love. Eros and Caritas are, are rather subtly brought together. But at the centre of this speech, we get the line, is not love a Hercules still climbing trees in the Hesperides? A whole series of classical allusions um, to Bacchus, to Sphinx, to Apollo, but at the centre, that image of Hercules climbing trees in the Hesperides uh, as being an image of the, the boldness of love. In the, that same scene, the great discovery scene, where um, the, uh, each of the, the, the lords and the king are overheard uh, being in love, despite having professed that they won't be. Um, Barone says, you found his moat, the king your moat did see, but I a beam do find in each of three. Oh, what a scene of foolery have I seen, of sighs, of groans, of sorrow and of teen. Oh me, with what strict patience have I sat to see a king transformed to a gnat, to see great Hercules whipping a gig. Cleopatra, in Antony and Cleopatra, reverting to that play, wonderfully remembers a moment that, alas, we don't see in the play, but it's remembered vividly. That time, oh, times, I laughed him out of patience. And that night I laughed him into patience. And next morn, ere the ninth hour, I drunk him to his bed, then put my tires and mantles on him, whilst I wore his sword, Philippin. The allusions here are to the story which comes after the labours, uh, the story of Hercules and Omphale. This is vividly told by Ovid on two occasions, uh, again in Herodes 9 from Deianara's point of view, but also it's beautifully told in the second book of the Fasti, um, and Ovid's Fasti was a key source for, for Shakespeare's Rape of Lucrece. Um, it's, oh sorry, I've hit the slide thing by mistake. Um, so, so it's a familiar story to Shakespeare. Um, indeed, in Locrine, that play which I mentioned last week, published in 1595, is being revised and overseen by W.S. Uh, it was a, a popular play in the repertoire. Uh, whether or not W.S. was Shakespeare, we shall see. But that's a, that's a play, um, a neo-Senecan tragedy, that at the beginning of each act includes a, um, a, a dumb show with telling a story out of mythology. And this is how the fourth act dumb show of uh, Locrine begins. Enter Arte, as before. Arte is the kind of presenter. Um, then Omphale, daughter to the king of Lydia, having a club in her hand and a lion skin on her back, Hercules following with a distaff. 
then let Omphali turn about and take off her pantoffel, strike Hercules on the head, and then let them depart. Ate remaining, saying, Stout Hercules, the mirror of the world, son to Alcmena and great Jupiter, after so many conquests won in field, after so many monsters quelled by force, yielded, yielded his valiant heart to Omphali, a fearful woman void of manly strength. She took the club and wore the lion's skin. He took the wheel and maidenly gan spin. So it's the classic moment of the male, the, the, the martial hero transformed into a, a feminine figure. That despite all those labours, despite the great victories on the field, Hercules is overcome by love, by a woman. Um, I've just put up here a, um, a, a rather um, w wonderful marble. Um, it's actually from... From, from Naples, we don't know the exact period, but it's uh, possibly 5th century uh, AD, of course, um, of Hercules wearing um, Lydia and Omphali's robes and um, holding the, um, the, the, the distaff there. Um, and um, Omphali has got the, um, the, 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 the club and, and the, 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 the landscape. A great image of cross-dressing, which Cleopatra is clearly referring to um, in her memory of wearing the sword of Antony. Now, this is the, the moment um, where I want to talk a little bit more about Seneca. I've mentioned him a couple of times. Um, but it seems to me in thinking about choice, questions of masculinity, femininity, um, and the idea that we're going to come on to of this, this idea of the kind of explosion of anger. Um, Seneca is an absolutely crucial figure. Um, I talked a little last week uh, about Seneca in the context of talking about Shakespeare and tragic genre. Seneca cannot be too heavy, as Polonius said in that quotation. Um, and there is no doubt that uh, the Elizabethan idea of tragedy is deeply shaped by Seneca. Um, whether it's neo-Senecan academic or court drama or the publication of those translations of the ten tragedies of Seneca. Seneca is uh, so of, of formative influence for notions of tragedy. But the really interesting thing about uh, the Elizabethan reception of Seneca um, is that it's not only to do with Seneca as a tragic dramatist but also to do with Seneca as a philosopher, as a thinker. Um, Seneca, Seneca's epistles and his essays, in particular the essay on anger, uh, uh, which was translated by Thomas Lodge, who was also a dramatist, um, are, are texts of, I, th I think, great, great significance. Um, this is an aspect of Hercules, actually, that we don't often think about, uh, that sometimes in the iconography of the period, um, Hercules is a figure um, associated with eloquent, eloquent speech and intellectual self-examination. Um, there's an image here from uh, Qatari's uh, uh, c collection of um, images of, of the gods, uh, where we have a figure of Hercules, um, once again wearing the lambskin. Um, but those lines coming out of his mouth, uh, and sort of going, going past his club, um, they're supposed to be suggestive of eloquence, of, her, as it were, Hercules the wordsmith. Um, now that's interesting because you would have thought from what Hamlet says when uh, famously he's comparing the image of his father and his uncle, saying how unlike they are, he says of Uncle Claudius, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Hamlet essentially saying, I am the man of words, of thoughts, the scholar, the intellectual. I am not the man of strength. Um, I am not a Herculean figure. But I, I think there is a, a strand of thinking about Hercules um, in the period where actually um, he, he, he is a figure of philosophical uh, significance as well as being the, the embodiment of the martial, of the 
of external self. And the question that leads me to is a question about notions of the self and of interiority. Um, for me, one of the great deficiencies of Stephen Greenblatt's highly influential book, Renaissance Self-Fashioning, a book which really has deeply influenced thinking about the early modern period for the last 30 years, um, is the lack of reference to classical precursors for uh, the ideas that he explores there. In particular, um, the central notion of Greenblatt's book, that the thing that characterises early modern writers, Shakespeare among them, is an interest in the fashioning of the self in the context of a world of political power. Greenblatt seems not to have read those intellectual historians and classicists who have argued fascinatingly that this is precisely what Seneca is about. Um, I came, I think, rather late to Michel Foucault's uh, last, or well, one of his last books, the third volume of his History of Sexuality, and I think one of his very best books, The Care of the Self, um, which has an extraordinarily powerful argument about the centrality of Seneca to the invention of the self. The, the key uh, argument that Foucault articulates in that book is that it was during the first century, the kind of golden age of Rome, that many key modern ideas about sexual restraint, um, about uh, monogamy, um, about the dangers of sexual pleasure, um, that it, it, was, it was at that time that those ideas emerged, and then, of course, they were absorbed into Christianity. Um, and obviously, Foucault's argument is that a kind of Greek polymorphous perversity and sexual joy uh, is expunged by a, a Christian Roman tradition. I mean, that, that's really what Foucault wants to, wants to get at. Um, but the, in, the really interesting thing about the argument is when he, he asks, why did this happen in the first century? And he suggests it's not because of a, um, a desire on the part um, of um, Roman moralists to, uh, as it were, upbraid the emperors for their debauchery, but rather because at the centre of the philosophy of Seneca and, uh, and some of the Stoics around him was a notion of the care of the self, a notion that the examined life involves a process of standing apart from oneself and then looking into oneself. It's, it's, it's never too early nor too late to examine and develop the self. And if the focus is in on the self, then the, the other, i.e. woman or desire, is a kind of distraction from that. I mean, that, that I take it to be the, the, the kind of essence of Foucault's argument. Now, I don't want to go so far as to say that Seneca did invent the self, because in a way that would be exactly like the mistake that sort of Greenblatt uh, makes in, in sort of saying the Renaissance invented self-fashioning, or God help us, Harold Bloom saying that Shakespeare invented the human. Um, but I, th I think as the, uh, the authors of a, an excellent collection published a couple of years ago called Seneca and the Self, as, as they suggest, Seneca is a key figure in the development of a modern sense of self that includes what one, one might describe as um, an interest in the second order phenomenon of self-examination. Um, uh, uh, inward, one, one, one of um, the, the, the scholars writing in, in, in Seneca and the Self uh, says this, the interest in second orderness in the form of talk about self-shaping and self-knowledge, the language of self-command, the focus on self-control, especially in the face of human natural proclivities to precipitate and to precipitate and passionate response, and the singling out of a moment of casually efficacious judgment or decision in the process of reacting to provocative stimuli. These are Seneca's contributions to the development of the will. There's an old argument that classicists have about whether Seneca invented the idea of the will. 
That's to say, the word voluntas and the verb vele are very, very significant at a number of key moments in Seneca's writings. And there is no equivalent for those words in Greek. Um, now, of course, inventing the word and inventing the idea aren't necessarily the same thing. But the, the notion that uh, this, this process of self-shaping, self-knowledge, self-command, um, and then the relationship of that to the will is, I, I think, at the centre of what the early modern period takes from Seneca. Um, just to, to sort of compress that idea uh, into, uh, into an idea one might be able to work with uh, in, in, in relation to Shakespeare's plays. Um, the, the Senecan self, in terms of his philosophical writing, is absolutely focused on the notion of quelling the emotions through the reason. Um, I mean, that's the kind of classic Stoic idea. What happens in Seneca, the dramatist, is he shows you the tragic outcome when the emotions are not tamed by the reason, when there is a kind of explosion of the emotions that overcomes the reason and leads to the opposite of reason, which is madness. If you try to think about Hamlet in those terms, you then actually see that, in some sense, what Hamlet is about, the challenge that Shakespeare sets himself in, ha in Hamlet, a play that is very self-consciously engaging with an Elizabethan tradition of Senecan drama, there can be little doubt, I mean, we know this from the, uh, the, the, the famous uh, Nash reference to you know, Seneca read by candlelight, there can be little doubt that the, the old Hamlet play that, that is lost, the so-called Ura Hamlet, usually attributed to Kidd, um, would have had at, at its centre a Senecan revenge figure, a, f a figure of a Senecan revenger, a figure analogous to the Hieronymo of Spanish tragedy. So what Shakespeare is doing in Hamlet is he's, he's taking dramatic Seneca, the figure of the revenger, who, who as has this explosion of anger that then leads to tragedy and multiple death, and then eliding that figure with a, a philosophical Seneca, a, a figure fascinated by exactly that process of self-examination, that second-order process of thinking self-consciously about self-knowledge, self-command, self and so forth. And of course, what Hamlet does eventually reach is a kind of stasis or reconciliation between these two Senecas when he comes to the point of stoic resignation in the special providence in a fall of a sparrow, sparrow speech, the what will be, will be, that moment of acceptance. It's only when he's accepted that that he then is able to release uh, the, him, him, himself as, as Senecan revenger. That, I think, is how I'd, I'd want to, to, to sort of develop this argument. But let's turn now to this moment of the, the explosion of passion, the, the madness of Hercules. Um, remember, give me that man that is not passion's slave. Uh, the, the idea of not being led by your passions that is the reason why Hamlet admires the Stoic um, Horatio so much. Not being passion's slave, the sense of restraint as the desire um, of, 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 of Seneca, the philosopher. So one short digression till we, till we get to that. Uh, one of the reasons for that, in terms of historical context, is, of course, precisely Seneca's position at the court of Nero. Um, the sense of what, what is the philosopher stroke counsellor to do in a corrupt political world. That was a very real dilemma faced by Seneca, who eventually, you know, Nero tells him, he, he, he needs to go and commit suicide. Um, there's a political aspect of this, and the, the digression is to say next week I'm going to be talking about Shakespeare and um, classical um, pol political thought, and Cicero is going to be at the centre of that. I'm going to be looking at the way that the figure of Cicero is dramatised in the theatre. Cicero is a character in Julius Caesar, but he's also a character in Ben Jonson's Catiline, His Conspiracy, and, and one or two other plays. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about uh, Ciceronianism in Shakespeare, which seems to me an under-researched subject. But the other thing that uh, I'll be doing in that context, and again, I said last week, if you want to do some homework, read Love's Labour's Lost. The other thing I'll be doing is I'll be puzzling away um, at a, 
uh, a, a figure who, who I, I and I think many other Shakespearean scholars have, really haven't fully grasped uh, or sort of understood the significance of. And again, it's a military figure. Um, and that's the figure of Alcibiades in Time and of Athens. Um, so if you want to do some homework, uh, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with Julius Caesar, uh, but Time and of Athens is the less familiar play that I will be talking about. So um, that's, that's for next week. Sidney, in the Apology for Poetry, says this. Anger, the Stoics say, and he's particularly thinking of Seneca here, was a short madness. Let but Sophocles bring you Ajax on the stage, killing and whipping sheep and oxen, thinking them the army of Greeks with their chieftains, Agamemnon and Menelaus. And tell me if you have not a more familiar insight into anger than finding in the schoolmen his genius and difference. This is Sidney arguing for the, the superiority of drama, of literature, over philosophy. See whether wisdom and temperance in Ulysses and Diomedes, valour in Achilles, friendship in Nisus and Euryalus, even to an ignorant man carry not an apparent shining. And contrarily, the remorse of conscience in Oedipus, the soon repenting pride of Agamemnon, the self-devouring cruelty in his father a Atreus, the violence of ambition in the two Theban brothers, the sour sweetness of revenge in Medea. There can be no doubt uh, that for the Elizabethans, tragedy and classical tragedy, which is mediated through Seneca, the direct knowledge um, of Sophocles, Aeschylus, and Euripides is, 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 is limited. I mean, Sidney, you know, highly educated, highly learned, aristocratic writer. In the world of the popular theatre, um, the, the, these Greek stories um, are coming through Seneca, through the Romans, and obviously through, through Ovid as well. Um, that sense of anger, um, it's some, the explosion of anger in a Shakespeare play is something very different from the choleric humour in a Johnson play. That's the, the point um, that, uh, that I'm seeking to make. Um, one of the ways in which um, Shakespeare uh, ex explores this, I think, is, is through his, his Senecanism. At the climax of Hercules Furens, the, the anger, the fury, the madness of Hercules, there is a moment where Hercules has, in a kind of blindness, killed his entire family. And what happens when he's done that is he awakens into a kind of, almost a kind of reverse anagnosis. You know, whereas uh, so often at the end of a, a classical tragedy, you have a, a, a moment of self-knowledge, a moment where too late the character comes to see what's happened and it all makes sense. I always remember the, uh, that great line in um, the climax of Ezra Pound's translation of The Women of Krakis, where uh, he says, come at it that way, what splendor it all coheres. It's only in the moment of death, after the ter terrible action, that everything seems to cohere. Um, but in Seneca, it doesn't cohere. It kind of collapses. And what it collapses into is a constant set of questions. There's about 28 questions that come in succession here. What place is this? What region? Where am I? What have I done? What are these bloody bo bodies? What are, what are these infernal shapes? What do I see before my eyes? And, 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 so he, and so he goes on. Um, where am I? Who am I? It, it, it's that moment of a, a complete dissolution from certainty into self-questioning. It's a very, very powerful thing, dramatically, the idea of the question. Um, one only has to look, for example, at the way that the progression of King Lear is from command through to questioning. You know, think of Lear's last great speeches. Um, you know, why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? Quest questioning, questioning. I could, if it wasn't a bit boring and had not been done before, I could very easily prove to you how well Shakespeare knew the Hercules Furens by demonstrating um, that Macbeth's and Lady Macbeth's lines um, about not being able to wash the blood off are lifted straight from the Hercules Furens. Uh, that, that, I think, is, 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 is pretty well known. Um, but it's Antony I want to 
to go back to, um, and a particularly powerful um, allusion as Antony is dissolving, as the Herculean Antony is coming towards his end. Tis well, thou art gone, if it be well to live, but better twere thou fellst into my fury, fury, that key, key word for anger, the, the, the Hercules Furens moment, for one death might have preferred many, pre prevented many. Eros, ho, I mean, it's a brilliant touch that, you know, Antony's um, armour bearer is given the name of Eros, precisely because it is Eros that has brought down the strength of Antony. The shirt of Nessus is upon me. Teach me Alcides, Hercules, thou mine ancestor, thy rage. Let me lodge Lycus on the horns of the moon, and with those hands that grasped the heaviest club, subdue my worthiest self. The witch shall die to the young Roman boy she sold me, and I fall under this plot. She dies for it. Eros, ho. Well, I hope you're beginning to see the whole of my lecture is kind of compacted into this quote. On the one hand, you've got this sense, subdue my worthiest self. This is precisely what the, uh, the, the Senecan philosopher tries to do. To, uh, um, equally, you've got Hercules, uh, Antony as Hercules, calling Alcides Hercules his, his ancestor, speaking of the rage. You've got this male against female principle, the demonization of Cleopatra um, as, as witch, the association with desire. It's not the first time uh, that Shakespeare has alluded to um, the story of the shirt of Nessus. There's a fascinating moment uh, uh, in The Merchant of Venice when, the, uh, when, when Morocco um, is, has made the wrong choice of casket. And he, he says, if Hercules and Lycus, Lycus who is the page or the servant who brings the poison shirt of Nessus to Hercules, if Hercules and Lycus play at dice, which is the better man, the greater throw, may turn by fortune from the weaker hand. So is Alcides beaten by his page, and so may I, blind fortune leading me, miss that which one unworthier may attain and die with grieving. There's a wonderful folio misprint, or maybe it's not a misprint, um, in, it, whereas the original quarto text says, so is Alcides beaten by his page. In the folio it says, so is Alcides beaten by his rage idea of actually being destroyed by your own anger, by your own rage. So this is the story which actually the bulk of the Ovid's version of the Hercules story in Book 9 of the Metamorphoses focuses on, which is the story of Dayanara, um, Hercules's love for her. Uh, this is just, it's rather earlier than Shakespeare, but I couldn't resist showing you because his club is so enormous in this. This is Jan Mabuz of Hercules and Dayanara. Um, there is a very rude joke that Baraccio has in The Merchant of, of, of Venice, um, uh, re referring to an old moth-eaten tapestry in which Hercules's codpiece is as big as his club. Um, and here, um, actually, I've, I've forgotten where I got this from, uh, but it, it's a 16th century uh, in, in, engraving of the shirt of Nessus being brought to Hercules. And I just like the smiley lion on that one. But of course, just as Antony blames the messenger, you remember that, uh, uh, well, both Antony and Cleopatra, they, they each have a scene, don't they, where they blame the messenger. Um, it's, uh, it's poor old Lycus who really gets the... Um, uh, gets the, the sharp end um, of uh, the, um, the rage um, of, uh, of, of, of Hercules. Um, let me lodge Lycus on the horns of the moon. This idea that Hercules, in his mighty strength, will throw Lycus um, across the world. Raises the question, should a tragedy end with a bang or a whimper. It seems to me that Seneca provides Shakespeare with three different models for the climax of a tragedy. There's the Hercules Furens model, the explosion of anger. Um, and we see that in Mark Antony's anger. There's also the philosophical or perhaps two philosophical uh, alternatives uh, coming from Seneca 
the thinker, Seneca the moralist, as opposed to Seneca the dramatist. There is that classic sense of stoic resignation, of a kind of serenity and acceptance, uh, which you find in Hamlet. And what I will be arguing in the, the longer kind of book version um, of this narrative um, is that actually uh, what, what happens there is a shading beyond Stoicism into a kind of Epicurean um, acceptance. Um, so the, the book's going to have a chapter on Shakespeare and Epicureanism, which, alas, you're not going to be able to, to, to hear, but you will one day be able to read when I get around to writing the thing. But then the third alternative... Um, is something equally philosophical but perhaps darker, um, which is particularly effectively seen um, in Macbeth, which is, uh, as I've said, with the, uh, the influence of the lines, what Tanais will wash me, or what Maeotis pressing barbarous floods into the Pontic Sea, not the mighty father himself with all his ocean will expiate such a crime. Um, what fierce Rhine or Tagus, flowing, swollen with the golden sand of Spain, will cleanse this hand. The, the lines that clearly influence will, all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand. No, rather my hand will the multitudinous seas and carnadine making the green one red. Um, but the other passage um, in the Hercules Furens that is so, I think, significant for Macbeth is from this great sequence at the end of the play where Hercules confronts the ruin of his, of his own life. Um, I'll, I'll read this. This is my own modern translation because the it, in Studley's translation, which I showed you a bit of earlier, it's, it's, it's a little bit top-heavy. Um, but roughly translated, there is no reason for me to hold, to delay my life longer in this light. I have lost all my advantages, mind, arms, fame, wife, children, even my madness. No one can be cured of a polluted mind. Crime must be cured by death. A fantastic idea that he's lost everything, not only his mind, madness, not only his arms, his fame, the military self, also his wife, his children, and then even his madness. He somehow even lost that. No one can be cured of a polluted mind. Crime must be cured by death. No one can minister to a mind diseased, the only cure is death. And that, of course, is the very nihilistic conclusion that Macbeth comes to when famously he says, I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honour, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have. Thank you.